Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Sports Exchange. My name is Scott Morgan, Roth from Motor City Madmouth, and I am pleased to be joined by Stuart Hack, or my regular co-host. Good evening, Stuart. Good evening, Scott. And I'm also joined by my favorite uh, analyst of all time, Mark Littell. Mark, thanks for being with us again. Thanks a lot, Scott. Glad to be here. All right, well, obviously, you know, this is our World Series broadcast, and there's no better person I'd rather have on, Mark, than you. Obviously, you've uh, participated in the postseason, so you're no stranger with it. So let's talk about uh, the uh, w w the 2020 has been a tough year, okay? Well, uh, the Baseball Hall of Fame uh, induction ceremonies will be without Whitey Ford, Bob Gibson, Lou Brock, Tom Seaver, Al Kaline, Joe Morgan, and you also mentioned another guy, Ron Paranowski, uh, yeah. as well. I don't know if he's in the Hall of Fame, but he certainly made the, an impact on – a lot of careers. So does, does this feel very empty knowing that you have six guys that were in the World Series that won't, aren't alive to see the latest fall classic and won't be at the uh, Cooperstown ceremony next year, hopefully when it takes place? Well, that's, uh, that's going to be tough for a lot of people because that all happened in less than six weeks, uh, a period, uh, maybe even closer to five. But, you know, I, 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 knew, you know, I knew Gibson, but I knew uh, Brock played with Brock and uh, <clears throat> it was pretty amazing just to sit there and these guys just dropped off out of nowhere so quickly. Gibson had pancreatic cancer and uh, Lou had also a type of cancer and passed as well. And uh, Lou had a, a very big following as well as Bob Gibson and they were both very community oriented as well. Uh, you, you know, you can also say a lot about Whitey Ford, you know, the the Yankee skipper right there, you might say his name just keeps coming up all the time. You know, you hear Whitey Ford, Yogi Berra, Whitey Ford, Yogi Berra. And that's, uh, you're still going to hear that with the past. So it's tough. Yeah. I guess Morgan, you know, another good player, a great player, a uh, great announcer as well. Did a great job. So. Did you have a relationship with some of these players throughout the years? I know that baseball to me, is a small world. I mean, being a writer, Mark, like I have been for the last 40 years, you know, you could be away from a guy for 10 years and it's like you never even uh, forgot him. And I know that when you talk about this big cocoon, it's really so small when you put things in perspective. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It, you know, it's not that you see him so much, but when you do bump into him or whatever, uh, yeah, you just pick up where you left off. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's a, uh, it's, it's a very close, uh, knit society of a uh, of group of people that they know you, you know them, you might have faced them, you've never talked to them, but you can all, you have, the, you speak the same language and, uh, and you know the same things about what they did. If I was a pitcher, I knew this guy's a hitter, this hitter knew so-and-so is a, and you, and you listen to him talk and, and the same is said about myself sometimes, I guess, too. So it's kind of, it's neat. Yeah. It's just camaraderie. It's a good camaraderie group. So. Yeah, I mean, again, this 2020 has been a tough year for everybody. And when you see legends like this pass away, yeah. and it just really, you know, they didn't go because of COVID-19. They obviously had diseases, but we all realized that we're only here for just a visit. But you, you hate to see so many of them go so quickly over the course of a six-month period. I mean, really, that's just unbelievable. You know, uh, Lou, <clears throat> Lou had lost his leg, actually, probably – five or six, seven years before uh, due to the cancer thing. And, uh, you know, that was just the start of it. He was an incredible person. He really, really was. Uh, you know, just where he came from and how he, he fought and, you know, he competed. He was, a, he was an incredible competitor. He, he wasn't a, a person that spoke a lot outwardly in the clubhouse. He was a quiet leader, you know, uh, he did, he came from a very, very poor background and uh, so poor that, you know, he passed out on a baseball field one day. Uh, he was out there and he's shagging down fly balls uh, and the college coach was noticing him. You know, he, he, he was on the side of the fence and he said, Hey, do you play baseball? And he says, yeah, yes, sir. I do. And so he said, well, go out there. He said, well, I'm left-handed. He said, well, we can find a left-handed glove for you. So he went out to center field and started, you know, running down some balls and eventually he passed out. And, you know, the, the coach was making note of that. But so he went out there 
And then he, you know, he got him off the field. He ended practice and he was talking to Lou. And the reason he passed out because he hadn't had anything to eat that day. Really? Wow. Yes. No kidding. Well, being a former Cardinal, I know the Cardinals probably, I got to believe, do a lot with their alumni. And there can be two bigger ones than Bob Gibson and Lou Brock for sure. Oh, yeah. They, yeah, they're, they were major. You know, there's no doubt about it. And you see the lineup, you know, down there where they're wearing their, uh, their Cardinal uh, Hall of Fame jackets as well. And you got, you know, Whitey. And you had, of course, you had Red Shane Dance. And you, you had the whole, you had a big lineup. And Suter was in there. You just had a big lineup out there on the field. Ted Simmons now, you know, is out there as well. Ted's going to come up, you know, this year in Cooperstown. And uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to all that. I think it's really cool. that. Yeah. Uh, Ted Simmons is actually from my hometown of Southfield, Michigan. He played over at Southfield High School. I never met him, but I do know that he, he's one of the bigger uh, names in my community. Do you get involved with many old-timers games, even with the Royals or the Cardinals or both? I know a lot of times it's a great opportunity for you to get involved with some of these guys. Yes, one. <clears throat> you know, with the, with the Royals, I did one one time. <clears throat> the Cardinals not, but I did throw out the first pitch two years ago in a Cardinal game. Matter of fact, I'll tell you something. It's pretty funny. You know, Pujols, so that was the very first time back for Pujols to uh, St. Louis when he was with the Angels. Right. So I guess Trout and Pujols were out there, and I was getting ready to throw out the first pitch, and, you know, the, the stands go up, and they start clapping. And, you know, I threw the, I threw the pitch in there. And I knew why the why why the I knew why the fans were all clapping. It was because Pujols was running off the field, and so I said to Joe Pfeiffer, "I said, look what I did! It's, isn't that amazing?" <laughs> that was the second largest crowd they had at Bush Stadium, uh, the new Bush Stadium ever. And I thought that was I said I can pack them in too. So you know whatever, <laughs> it's pretty cool. Well, I hope you got a good nutty buddy <laughs> and promoted some books while you were doing it because you certainly had numbers with you there. Oh, yeah, well, of course. But, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty neat when you go into Bush Stadium, as, as any ballpark for that matter. I mean, that was my first time in there. And, uh, uh, you know, they, they averaged, you know, 42,000. And, of course, they had it packed, so whatever they had that night. But you're seeing a, a whole stadium of red, you know, and, you know, you're seeing these, you know, these, the mad Cardinal fans that have been there forever, you know. Right. So they like their Cardinal baseball. That's for well, sure. Well, make no bones about it that St. Louis is one of the best baseball towns in the country. They really are. Oh. I mean, they really, I mean, you know, you think about it, anybody ever remember when Mark McGuire was traded there uh, and then he ended up getting a take and see look and he can say he liked it so much the Cardinals can afford to make these big trades get these guys in there the guys like it then they sign on anyways you yeah. know so there's a there must be a certain appeal about St. Louis and the gateway to the arch or you'd have a lot of one and dones or rentals for a year but that doesn't happen there right Stuart yeah yeah no St. Louis is a great town you know all these guys that pass you know it reminds you of a different time in baseball compared to now and you know with Bob Gibson they told the story when he passed that the last batter he faced in a major league game was Pete LeCock, who hit a home run. Ten years later, at an old timers game, he clocked him. So there's a the, the, the memories there. You know, he had a short memory. He remembered it, and I don't know if Pete LeCock had any idea it was coming. You, know, you think it's an old timers game, everything's relaxed, but Bob Gibson never forgot. That's a. Uh... Pete LeCocq, is, uh, his father was uh, Peter Marshall with the Hollywood Stars. Oh, and, yeah. uh, and Pete was playing with Kansas City in 76. And uh, his, his, his dad came down to the clubhouse. You know, like a few of them, you know, you didn't pay attention, but you did, because that's Peter Marshall for one thing. Yeah, and, I heard about that. You say he was the uh, – that's right, he was with the Hollywood Squares, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah, yeah Peter, Peter Marshall's birth name was Peter LeCocq. Oh, was exactly. it? Oh, okay. Now, yeah. now I see the connection here. Yeah, they didn't want that on TV, I guess, whatever. <laughs> well, you know, those Hollywood people, they, they have these simplified names like Marshall. Who's going to know anyways, right? No, exactly. In the retrospect. Yeah, I can only imagine a Pete LeCocq, the uh, the uh, game show host of the Hollywood Scores, or Peter Marshall. You tell me which one makes more sense and more simple. I mean, really. But they don't do that. <laughs> I'll, I'll, go, I'll, go, I'll go a step further, Scott. Okay. Is, his his sister 
you know, Pete was, we were, we were chewing the fat one day and he said, uh, he said, well, I've got a sister that, you know, does a little bit of modeling. I said, Oh, really? I said, I said, uh, he said, she, uh, I said, who for? He says, well, you ever see the Pepsi commercial? And I said, yeah. I said, she's the girl on the beach holding the Pepsi. I said, whoa, she's hot. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> well, she was, I mean, you couldn't miss it. And you know, it's kind of like, you know, flashback, <laughs> you know, you know, me, me and Joe Green was something, but you know, I'll take the Pepsi commercial. Well, if I told you one of the most bizarre stories that I can tell you guys, and I can tell it to you because you're friends, but back in 1987, when I was the director of public relations for the Gastonia Rangers, and that was a team, by the way, that had Sammy Sosa, Juan Gonzalez, and company. So I go down to a game over at, uh, I go down to Myrtle Beach for just a weekend, okay, just a weekend hanging out, never been to Myrtle Beach, mm-hmm. and it's a cool place, you know. So I go out there, and yours truly saw this adorable blonde lady selling lemonade. And let me tell you, by the end of that day, if I didn't get fr- fried to a tilt, I don't know what was, and I landed up in the hospital, I had to take a couple of days off from work. But a gorgeous blonde le- lady selling lemonade on Myrtle Beach, you know, it, it was a beautiful time hanging out with her, talking with her, buying a little lemonade. But when I got to the hospital, it wasn't so beautiful anymore because it hurt. I mean, I didn't. I, I never uh, grabbed any silver cane, and at that particular point, I don't know if it would have worked, anyways. But between lemonade, yeah, Gastonia yeah, and the South Atlantic League are a sweat league because I coached there one year for the Charleston Charleston uh, team. Oh, did you really? Yeah, it's cold. It's hotter than all hell. You know, you throw batting practice out there. You know, it, it's it's pretty amazing. It's like when I coached in New Orleans, <clears throat> and, uh, and and I like food, uh, and I'm sitting out there throwing. It's hot. Just that's one. That's got to be that and Charleston are the two hottest places I ever thrown batting practice. So you're throwing about 70 times out there for sure. And you think, oh, you're gonna lose all this weight. Well, if you go out and eat, you know, New Orleans, you know, mufalettas, you, you know, how, how could it be that I gained 20 pounds? <laughs> it's crazy. Oh, sure. <laughs> so you were you, you actually coaching? Yeah. So you remember Sims Legion Park then? The old ballpark. You're right. They're building a new one right now. Rick Curdy, the other guy you're on, obviously lives in that part of the country, and they're uh, building a brand new one in the area. But yeah, I remember Sims Legion Park. So I, a great story I can tell you about that was Sammy Sosa and I used to hang out a lot, and he he would tell uh, the owners. Uh, one of them was a wife. Hey, Nina, you cheap because she didn't want to spend any more money for a bag of dirt with one game left to go. So go yeah. figure. So it's safe to say he could afford his own dirt later on down the road. And and the irony about that whole thing is I remember when I moved here to South Florida back in the early uh, 2000s, I came across Sammy and uh, the Chicago Cubs PR lady named Sharon Panazzo, I think her name was. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I'll never forget. I said, Sharon, I want to talk to Sammy. She said to me like I'm crazy. So you know what I did? Okay, I said, hey, Sammy, remember me? And I mean, I was loud. He gives me this big old wide Sosa smile that was from here all the way to Alaska. And I said, Sharon, listen, I did the job you did in 87 when nobody paid attention to this guy. I want to talk to him. And when Sammy gave me that look, I had that one-on-one interview at his locker. We started reminiscing. Great interview. Thanks to the Florida Marlins who didn't draw any media anyways. And I was able to talk to Sammy. I won't get any of the other stuff later because it's not material. But again, you talk about stories of how paths cross and so forth. And, you know, I just love when you talk about the Pepsi girl, I had no choice but to go to the lemonade and the lemonade originated because I got a job over in Gastonia and that's that. <laughs> so. Stuart, do you have any girl stories from the accounting? <laughs> um, my wife's in the next room, so we're going to have to whisper. Okay, gotcha. All right, <laughs> sure. But uh, the way I remember South Carolina, as far as Charleston, and it's a great town, is that uh, 1990, we didn't know if we were going to start the season there or not because Hugo had knocked down one of the major light standards. But the mayor said, we will have baseball in Charleston, and that they did. So it was all good. Yeah, Charleston, South Carolina is a beautiful place, that's for sure. I've been there, spent a weekend there, and yes. it really is a dynamite place. So, all right, let's talk a little bit about baseball, about some of the rule changes that have occurred, and then we'll go ahead and get to the series itself. So, Mark, uh, after watching the extra inning rule for one year, do you think that it should be a permanent uh, uh, part of the game uh, with the man on second base? 
be? No, I think we should go back to 1972 and beyond and just make everybody happy and, and you know, make it America's game again. How about that? So, you know, I've seen, I've seen that. That's called the California rule, by the way, that we, it started out as because I had done that with amateur teams out in Arizona because I coached professionally 18 years. But when I stepped into the amateur ranks and the college ranks, I had some college teams out there too. You know, the amateur teams, they did that about, oh gosh, I cannot remember. It was about six or seven years ago. And we were at a tournament and they put a runner on second because we had a tie ball game. I said, what's this? Oh, this is the California rule. They do this stuff over in California. So we're in Arizona. Good grief. So, <laughs> so, to get, so to get this thing sped up, that's exactly what they did because you had to shift fields. And, you know, with all the fields out there, uh, spring training sites where they held these things, uh, you know, it, it's money. So you just can't have extra innings when they're trying to have, you know, 50 teams switching fields all the time. Right. All the time. So... Yeah, you know, the, the first time I ever saw it was in the Florida State League, and I couldn't stand it, to be honest with you. That's, you know, for a pitcher, it's a nightmare. I understood why everything was done here during the shortened 60-game campaign. They had to uh, speed the games up. They had to get as many as you can. You had 17 double header, blah, blah, blah. But yep. to me, for them to even consider such a rule like that, uh, man, that's second. I, I do have a problem with the purity of the game, uh, especially with that particular rule. So, obviously, we're in the uh, World Series. Is it unheard of that in the World Series that a game should be a bullpen day instead of having a true starter? Yeah. I think you're going to see a lot of that from now. I mean, it's just the way of the world. I mean, that's what's happening during the regular season. You're seeing it. You saw it in the earlier playoffs. You're seeing it tonight in the World Series for the Dodgers. Just, I, I, for whatever reason, that's how it is. Well, the, the guy pitching tomorrow night, what – Who's the guy starting tomorrow night for uh, the Rays? You brought it up, Stuart. Um, the pitcher for tomorrow's the game. Uh, well, it's an off day. They're playing tonight. I mean, um, yeah. uh, and, and we were talking about, you know, somebody only going so many innings and then coming in with the bullpen right behind it. Right. So, I mean, they've done this where, where they go two, 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 whatever it, it takes to get through this whole mess. And, you know, it's, in, it's interesting because you're going to take a starter or a starter that's had a long year maybe in, in today's standards, and, you know, toward the end of the year, he's going to go out to the bullpen and throw two innings, and he's going to be hopefully, I guess, useful, you know, for the tail end of this, uh, this run. And uh, if you're going to put more teams in it next year, as they're talking about, uh, you know, you're going to have the pitching core deeply involved, more so, and, you know, a lot of people, they always say, well, look at this hitter and look at that hitter. But it, when it comes right down to it at the end, it's all about pitching. It really is. And, and defense. And defense. Defense is big. And uh, that's one thing. Uh, you know, the Blue Jays have very good defense. Obviously, the Dodgers do, too. Or they both wouldn't be where they are right now. But I really, I really struggle with that, Mark. I really, really do. To have a bullpen day, really? I mean, come on, two, three innings. I mean, you know, it almost borders with some of the things that we've spoken about, not last week, but throughout the season, that is this game going to become so unwatchable that you have to see things that you would never imagine? You know what I mean? Obviously, the, I understand them going to the shift a little bit here and there. I mean, in certain cases, I could accept certain changes, but not to a point where we're talking about a bullpen day in the – World Series. That's just, I don't know. I really, really struggle with that, Mark. I really, really do. And you well, being a guy that's played in the game, I, I can imagine you probably might too. Well, the thing, thing is, is that you know, you're going to read about the starters in the paper and, and you're going to say, you know, BBC, you know, it's bullpen by committee. That's going to start. <laughs> so you're going to, you know, bring in four, your four pitchers and they might as well have those four pitchers in a row already listed. So you got bullpen by committee. At, at your BBC at the time. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, I was a closer, and, you know, back then the closers, we'd go two, three innings, you know, in a shot. And then, you know, sometimes we'd go in innings. Sometimes, you know, I got my first save on one pitch. I remember one time it was in Oakland. I threw a pitch, and the guy popped it up. I said, hallelujah, I can't believe I get a save for this. You know, they, they switched the rules, you know, and stuff like that. So You just, know, you see that a lot, you know, when the rules change, everyone's shocked, and it's like, oh, my God, what's happening Yes. You know, they put the designated hitter in in 1973. There was an outcry. It was like, why Why are they doing this? Exactly. But yeah. You're going to see the universal DH. That's going to be the one thing out of this season. I think that's going to stick permanently. And even things like, you know, from Mark's day, as he said, 
he would go multiple innings as a closer, then it went for one inning, and that's become the norm. Right. So things, little by little, things change. And even these bullpen by committees, we could be having this conversation in 15, 20 years. Right. And that's a normal thing. And we're not going to say, oh, my God, that's horrible. That's just going to be the normal. In fact, if they ever switched back to where a starter was going five or six innings, we'd be like, oh, my God, wow, five or six innings. That, that, that's pretty radical there. Right. But then if you put things in perspective, I asked Don Manning with this uh, earlier in the year, and I asked him, if we're going to have these types of things where you have to have at least five innings to get a win, do you even modify the rule maybe of four innings get you a win? I mean, because then you really – we all know that baseball is predicated, Mark, and stew around statistics. If you're going to go ahead and make a philosophical change, what we're doing, why don't you modify how you get a victory as well and make it four rather than make it five? And, and, and I think the other thing that will probably stick is a three-batter uh, rule as well. But then I don't have a problem with that one only because back in the day when you pitched, Mark, two or three innings was the norm anyway. So what's three batters? You know, that was the old time, you know, and there aren't very many pitchers that nowadays go more than an inning unless you bring out Josh Hader, and I'm sure there's a few other guys that yeah. can handle it either era. But, you know, to me, I I don't know. I would think that if you're going to go by bullpen by committee, that, that there should be a minimum of four innings to at least get a victory in this whole thing if you're going to modify it to that point. Now, does that cheapen a 20-game winner? Well, yeah, it, that's kind of interesting. There's all kinds of variable rules in there, though, to determine a winner. And uh, I've actually argued it before as a minor league coach uh, before, and I've, I've actually won it, too, because I made the point of, you know, the guy make, getting doing a better job. It, it's actually a, a judgment call by the official score. So uh, I, I did that twice, I remember, to where I said, you know, this guy really deserves the save because the, the guy went in and got in four and two thirds and the guy that came in, he kind of did okay. But the guy that finished out the game should have got the win, you know, cause he, he did a much better job in my, in my second pitcher. And my, the, the guy that closed it out and, you know, they, they agree, you know, to that. It, it's purely a judgment call. I can't remember what rule it falls under. It's six right. weeks or whatever. So, but, you know. Yeah, so you know the interesting thing, you know, if guys having their, contracts like incentives for wins and now things change like that and, and if it becomes an official scorer's decision good point whether someone gets a win or not you know you could see like i remember bobby Bonilla went up to the official scorers once he got charged with an error he didn't like it i don't think the official scorer changed it but you might have players contacting official scorers saying you know hey you know i deserve the win no i deserve the win you know, what does it come to? We'll have a fan vote after the game. Okay, mm -hmm. you know, call this number. Hit one if you think Mark Littell deserves the win. Hit mm -hmm. two if you think Goose Gossage deserves the win. Right. Actually, uh, a staff member has to, to, uh, to, to call on that, not the player. They won't talk to a player. <laughs> so, it's kind of interesting. But, no, you're, you're right. You know, that's a big, big thing about the statistics. And the other thing, too, is I was sitting here thinking was, remember when they used to have the setup man? Well, they don't have a setup man anymore. I mean, I haven't heard the setup man. Well, where's the setup man? Oh, well, there's four of them, I guess. Well, they, is it really a closer? <laughs> you know, they have the eighth inning guy. That's like a new term. Yeah. Or the seventh inning guy. You know, that's kind of replacing what setup was. Sure. So, you know, and then, but, the, you know, the terminology, the analytics, you know, the whip, the whatever, the, you know, it's, uh, you, you got to dig into it. You got to have a chart to read it. So, and, and then to calculate it, you know, there's all kinds of, uh, which you're very good at, Stuart. So that, that's your area. <laughs> it's certainly not mine. That's for sure. No. Yeah. I know. I, I'm, no, I'm usually known for the Webster's dictionary, not the calculator, like my uh, uh, hack attack. Okay, counterpart here, that's for sure. I mean, you know, he's got Webster's, he's got the uh, Texas Instruments, at least that's what they were uh, back in the day when they were 40 bucks a head. But yeah, know. that's about right. Never too far away from me. <laughs> I, I know, I figured that. <laughs> yeah, but I, I was waiting for that, uh, Stuart. Okay, so, <laughs> so good. Uh, so, anyways, Mark, are you glad that Tampa defeated Houston to preserve the dignity in the sport? that his sub-500 team didn't even make it to the fall classic. That would have been a disaster. Oh, I was for the underdog anyway, you know, and uh, I think they have, what, 24, 28 million. They're 
payroll. And then if you look at the Dodgers payroll, just skip the coin here, you know, they're at 114 million or something, some odd number out there. It's four times or whatever, you know. So I'm kind of for the underdog right there. You know, I was watching the pitcher. Uh, who's the, who was the pitcher, Stuart, last night uh, for Tampa? Oh, Glass now? Glass now. I was watching Glass now pitch. And, you know, he, he wasn't hitting his mark. He was missing, you know, a little bit here and there. And he was, he was missing enough that, you know, you kind of thought he was going to run into some trouble, some issues down the line. And he did. He ended up throwing a lot of pitches. Uh, I don't think he made it through the fifth, actually. He ended up throwing, I think, 110 or so, which is a lot, you know. You know, 12 to 14, 12, 14 pitch innings are, you know, that's where you want to be, you know, get off the field. When you're throwing, you know, 15, 18 pitches, when you're throwing 18 pitches, somebody's probably going to score on you at that point, you know, you, unless you're living life right. Do you think the players on the field, they were nerves because – in last night's game, obviously, you didn't have the fans screaming like you normally would for a World Series game. Do you think – I, I mean, I, it's, it's hard to say. Like, normally, a young player could really be unnerved, you know, sell out crowd, World Series game if they've never really been in a big game before. Mm. But do you think last night had the feel on the field of a World Series game? You know, I think it actually does. I mean, I don't know about each and every player. But I think it does because you're out there to compete. And it's like, you know, if you're competing as Spartans to kill somebody, you know, and who's going to die? You know, you still want your head held up high. You know, you still want to say, here, this bud's for you. <laughs> and, but, uh, <clears throat> but the other factor is, is that I know personally, I, I really like pitching with crowds, to tell you the truth. I liked, I was a little bit of a ham in a sense, but I, I liked it. And, you know, they didn't get you up or anything. It's just that you knew you had to get the guy out. Yeah. You know, it's not so much, hey, I got to throw a strike. No, I got to get an out. <laughs> so, you know, you can throw strikes all day. They can hammer the hell out of you too all day. So, but you got to get an out. Wasn't I, I think it was Zach Granke who says he, he, he likes it better without the crowds. He's not really a people person. Yeah. He, he likes it. Yeah, but he's nuts, though, see? So he slipped out. Yeah. <laughs> but he says he doesn't like it when fans ask him for autographs. It bothers him. So he said he really likes this with no, no one in the crowd. And He probably but, does. But he's a strange bird anyway. Oh, yeah. I, I heard that uh, Zach Granke has had bouts of depression anyways and anxiety. So. You think? Yeah. I can hardly <laughs> know. I'm being nice about it, okay? So, yeah. No, no. He's a great guy. Right. And you know what? He's a hell of a pitcher. And I'm, yeah. I'm always in his corner. He is a great interview because he is so funny because he says nothing really. And he just talks in spurts. I love to watch his interviews. Oh, yeah. Really do. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was trying to be sarcastic just so you know. You know I know. I know you were. <laughs> but, uh, come on. We got to add a little bit of life. I, I was the bad boy. <laughs> oh, no, that's okay. Hey, listen, Mark, the one thing I love about it, what we bring you on, is this show is anything but boring. We know that for crying out loud. That's right. something you, uh, you know, I my t tell my wife she'll tell you. Yeah, I mean, I'm Mark Latell tonight. So yeah, you you'll uh, you won't sleep all night because you're gonna think of how much fun you had on the broadcast, and you can't wait to get them on the next one. So it doesn't matter. Well, I, I got to get with it then here. So I'll I'll wake up here in a second. Yeah, so. right. Well, you're you're a true four, my friend. Let me tell you. So I, I got to ask you. I mean, I don't know if we've talked about this before. We'll bring it up again though. Should there be an asterisk on this year's champion? It's play ball, you know, whatever it is, but. You know, you know, you have some guys that <clears throat> if they had continued for the rest of the year, you don't know what their batting averages would have been or their or the pitching if it would have fell off or some guys would have improved. You don't know that. Uh, I guess you could say that. It's kind of like you need an asterisk, you know, because guys were on, you know, PEDs and smoking pot and joints and crack and everything else. And, you know, I don't know. But as an asterisk warranted on a 60-game season uh, to get the world's – I'll tell you what, the postseason – has definitely played to its true form like it does every other year. You yeah. know, it's a grind, and they played a lot of games in a row. And I think yeah. the one thing that we can – it's safe to say that did not happen was during a shortened campaign, you didn't have a 400 hitter, so that will never come into play. I think, uh, what was it, D.J. LeMahieu 
hit like what 360 something. I don't know if that my head. So at least that record per se was not uh, attacked there. So we don't have to you know downplay the significance on it. You know, I may not like the analytics and all the other things that are happening with baseball, but you have to give your tip your hat to the commissioner on this one for having baseball. Yeah. Oh, you know, and getting it done. You also have to tip your hat to the teams that are in <clears throat> the uh, World Series and the playoffs. <clears throat> To the administrators, you have to tip your hat. To the managers, to the, to the, to the teams that made it all happen. You right. know, even though there was COVID, you know who was you know uh, uh, who was steady, who who was going who was steady and going after and, and going forward to try to stay healthy during this whole mess. You know, so they had to they had to be very diligent about their work ethic and uh, and being healthy at the same time. You know, I was on a Marlins media availability call. Don Manningly had his season ender, and he's doing it from the comfort of his own home. And the thing he was asked during the uh, media availability, what do you like best about being out of the bubble? And you know what he said? Mm. Being able to eat on normal plates with silverware and not out of a, uh, not out of a uh, paper container or a paper plate. Yeah. I mean, I get it. And what this guy went through, and I'll tell you what, he's a sporting news manager of the year, and I hope he gets the AP. Let's talk about Manny Lee. Do you feel that he is the manager of the year outright, Mark? Yeah, he's done He's done a really good job with a bunch of especially young kids that, uh, you know, they were just, you know, pushing him off to the side. No, this isn't going to happen. And he made it happen. You know, he made it happen. He made them believe in themselves to go out there between the lines and play the game of baseball the way it should be up to their uh, their highest level, you know, at the, at, that they could do it. And they competed. So, you know what, they're going to walk into next season <clears throat> and uh, they're going to be a reckoning. So that's all good. It's all good. Have you ever met, you know, Don Manning Lee, have you ever met him at all? Shook hands with him once. I know he's from Evanston. He's a redneck, you know, like me. So whatever. <laughs> Yeah, Evans, uh, Evansville, Indiana, as I understand it, right? Right, that's close enough. They grow corn. Oh, do they? <laughs> <laughs> we have soybeans. They have corn. <laughs> yeah, Don, he's a pretty uh, down-to-earth guy. He knows his baseball, and he's done a really good job with that franchise. He really has. And you're right, he's the most even-keeled, down-to-earth guy. But what he had to endure with all those – uh, the outbreak early, everybody's laughing at him, and then all of a sudden the Cardinals got hit with it. And, and, and everybody had to take it serious. And I, I think you're right, Mark. In fact, I know you're right. That Rod Manfred, they could have closed this season down anytime they wanted, but they worked through it. And they to get to this point, to see a bubble over at Globe Life Field and the manner for which the baseball has been top-notch, it really has been. You know, and uh, it's, it, it is amazing, that's for sure. But so how do you like the way the bubble is working out playing at Globe Life Field as well as Petco, Dodger Stadium, and of course out in uh, Houston? I mean, they've had the four, you know, uh, places. Uh, do you think it's worked out quite well? I know that Globe Life Field I hear is brand new. They say it's a gorgeous ballpark. You know, I think it's, it's, it's middle ground for everybody. And uh, you have to have middle ground. Uh, it, it is, like you say, a gorgeous ballpark. I think they just want a, a nice playing field, and they've got one. And uh, it really doesn't matter what town they're in so much, but that's the that was the perfect pick, I'm, I'm thinking, anyway. You know, the key was to cut down on travel. And, yes. and that's what they're doing. Because normally during a World Series, you know, after game two, the teams would move to the next city. And then after game five, they'd come back. So they wanted to eliminate that and just put everything in one spot so the players didn't have to move around. Stuart, did they have uh, did they have fans in the stadium a little bit on the, on that World Series? Did they have a few? I, you know, I didn't. From what I, I don't think so. I think it was just the um, cardboard cutouts. Okay. I, well, I, think know. Allowing, I do believe they're allowing fans for the World Series, but just not a lot of them. I think maybe. Are they? Yeah, from what I heard, I, I could be wrong, but I think that they are allowing them there. But I, I do know that. The thing that Manningly told me was when they got to the playoffs, they weren't used to having so many days off in a row, but especially since they didn't have it. They were playing like 28 games in so many days. And and he, he didn't like it because, you know, his guys got in a rhythm. And, you know, Mark, being in the game as long as you have, that baseball is a sport where when you're a creature of habit, you're used to doing things a certain way. And then you break out of that 
have it, then you become a little bit rusty. And I, I'm not going to make excuses for teams that didn't play well in the World Series that, uh, you know, where there was a drop off between the championship series or World Series. But when you're hot, you're hot. When you have time off, then you cool off, it seems like to me. Is there yeah. some relevance and truth to that? Oh, yeah. You, you, you want to stay busy. You want to stay active. And, uh, you know, that was the one thing I think we might have brought it up a little bit last time where they, they're going to have four down days, you know, the right. uh, Tampa Bay. Of course, the Dodgers had the two. Uh, and then, you know, they're, they're, sometimes that's better, you know. And the fact that uh, Stuart had mentioned that Urea was starting when tomorrow or the next day, was it? Uh, yeah, the pit uh, for Dodgers. Well, Bueller's starting game three. Oh, okay. And then I, you know, I'm not sure what they're going to do game four. It might be Urea. And then I guess they can come back with Kershaw in game five. Right, right. They have him eligible to relieve if they go to a game seven. Okay, yeah. well, our correct statistician, Ken, the Evelyn, gave me uh, the attendance numbers for game one, 11,388 were at Globe Life Field. So they're obviously a lot of fans, <laughs> and I'm sure they're spread out pretty well. So indeed they are. So she was able to dig that for us. So our correct statistician, Candy, let's one see of, comes through. Yeah. <clears throat> one of the big things is, is that there are no Dodger dogs, obviously. But, <laughs> but Texas – has a two foot dog, I hear, and it's twenty seven dollars and fifty cents for that dog. How much? Got chili all over it, and two, it's twenty seven fifty for this two foot hot dog. You know, I don't know what they call it. Party you know, Got chili and cheese and onions and jalapenos and maybe even you know, so you're eating pig lips and pig ears. You know, for a hot dog anyway. So that's about it. I think my cholesterol just went up a little bit just listening to that. Yeah, and, and I, I have to wonder what the calories would be on such a dog like that. Was about five thousand calories or something like that? Oh, I can only imagine. Twenty seven dollars yeah. for five thousand calories? Ah, you know what? I'll go up to Milwaukee and get a bratwurst instead. <laughs> and Mark, you know a little bit about those bratwursts up in Milwaukee, don't you? They're pretty good. Yeah, exactly. Well, you got twenty seven fifty worth of dog there. You know, of course, I don't know how. What's the diameter of the dog? You know, is it is, is it like a a brusky you know dog up there uh, in Milwaukee where they have the big ones, or they, or do they have the little slinky things? I love to see someone yeah. trying to eat it. I don't know. When I when I was over on the press box, I used to eat them. All, all I know is we can't get them in South Florida, but nothing like a good old brat in a at Miller uh, Park over in the uh, dining area. That was a pretty good. I wasn't losing any uh, – I was gaining a lot of weight for those few days when the Tigers played the Milwaukee Brewers for a three-game series when I was out there uh, a couple of years back. But $27 for a two-foot-long hot dog with all the trimming? Twenty-seven fifty. Oh, pardon me. All right, so, so am I going to have to go over to the store and get twenty-seven fifty, a four-digit number here for the uh, lottery and see if I can make a little coin so, I can, so Stuart and I can take our trip out to North Dakota? <laughs> pig lips and pig ears, that's all you're getting on that dog. You know, that's all that dog's worth. <laughs> that's you know, pretty bad. All right, so let's talk about Clayton Kershaw, Mookie Betts. They make more money than the Tampa Bay Rays payroll. My <laughs> God, is that amazing or what? Well, well Stewart, Stewart's the numbers, guys. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's, David versus, it's David versus Goliath. So, you know, you have the powerful Dodgers, the big money Dodgers, and – the you know the lesser market raise so you know i i guess a lot of us would root for the raise to take down the dodgers um dodgers have been in the world series every year and have come up empty mm. and, and we had discussed too dave roberts job security if right. they have a World series loss or they well last week at this time we didn't think they'd get to the world series right um, i i would think he's at least guaranteed a job for next year right um, but the leash, will, <laughs> the, the leash will get a little smaller, especially if he loses the series this year and, you know, next year he doesn't start off well. Man. Because the Dodgers, the Dodgers, it's been 32 years since the world championship. 1988, right? Yep. When Kurt Gibson hit that monstrous home run in game one and never saw the playing field again, but you talk about – the makings of a Robert Redford, the natural movie. I mean, you're talking about the Hollywood makeover. That was unreal. Oh, yeah. this isn't going to be a match made in Hollywood. Yet it does. This is a matchup. You know, you have – but think about it. Mookie Betts 
who last night stole two bases and nearly had home stolen and was able to walk in there off that manufactured a run with an infield ground out. So, but the, it sounds like when the Dodgers took that eight to one lead, you almost got the feeling whether or not the Tampa Bay Rays were actually shell shocked. But at least yesterday you saw that those two fellows earned their money. Clayton mm-hmm. Kershaw gets you what close to six strong innings, and everybody knows that Mookie bats to me. And I, you know the last game that I saw. Uh, and my wife saw before COVID-19 shut everything down, we saw the Milwaukee Brewers take on the Dodgers at Camelback Ranch, and baseball got shut down right then and there. And that was in March. But and we saw Mookie Betts, uh, you know, at a press conference over at Camelback. Trusting the L.A. media, it was interesting to be a part of that whole thing. But, you know, I, I think what's interesting is when you look at Mookie Betts and Clayton Kershaw, Mark, can you some – put into perspective what those guys actually mean to an organization like that. <laughs> you better get it done. <laughs> so, uh, you know, they're, they're leaders, uh, obviously, and they, they they all fit together well. You know, Kershaw, I always thought Bueller right now was the number one type of guy and Kershaw was the number two. I mean, there has to be a shift at some point, you think. And and then, you know, Kershaw throws a, you know a good game last night and you know, he's proven he's number a number one guy, as always. Of course, the interesting thing about being a number one guy, you're always facing the, the number one guy on the other side. Right. You know, that's the issue right there. You've got strict, you know, big competition. So that that's going to be a good battle, hopefully. And then you've got, you know, Bats doing his thing. And uh, he has a presence when he walks on the field. It's like, you know, Pete Rose walking onto a field or Joe Morgan. Or anybody of that nature, there is a presence there, and and the players respect that. They don't have to talk very much, but they fit in very well. I'm sure on that bench and in that clubhouse, they fit yeah. in very very well. And when you talk about the David and Goliath matchup, I mean, two guys eating up the payroll for what would be a small market team. I guess you're right. I mean, that doesn't get any better than that. These guys could buy stock in the Rays if they want to with what they're earning, but yet. You know, Mookie Betts was rewarded with a 12-year contract with the Dodgers. He's a foundational piece. I think Kershaw has a couple more years left. But you you guys are right, especially you, Stu, when you say that at least Kershaw will be able to get the monkey off his back. He won't have to deal with the championship talk in the postseason. And that's got to be like having a big gorilla on his back right now, isn't it, Mark? Yeah, you look at, you know, interestingly what you said is if you look at Pat Mahomes. Now, there's a switch right there. Where did you hear that name? Kansas City Chiefs. Well, he got 300 and something million or whatever it was. And, and now he's a owner in the Royals. He has ownership in the Kansas City Royals. Right. So, I mean, does he have that much impact to come across the, the street right there, you know, between the stadiums and say, hey, you know, here, I'm, I want to be a part of a Royals ownership. I didn't think it acted that way, but I'm sure they said, hey, how would you like to fit in right here? So he's going to be part of Kansas City football and baseball. So he's a community figure all of a sudden at his ripe young age of, what, 25 maybe? Right. So there you go. You know, the Chiefs have to be happy about that because, you know, that means he's vested in the community and he's going to want to stay. Right. Good point. Very good point. Yeah. Yeah, it's, It's refreshing too, Mark, because nowadays at a time where free agency and movement is so high, to see a guy like Patrick Mahomes, stay in one place and be a part of it. It seems like it's so rare these days when you have the likes of Tom Brady, uh, to name a bunch of guys that end up changing cities for whatever reason, that a young guy like Patrick Mahomes is, I'm happy where I'm at, you know, and that is a really refreshing change from the norm. So how do you size up this matchup, Mark? I mean, obviously the Rays looked like they were shell-shocked when they went on the field. They trailed eight to one and never recovered. And yet the, they still, uh, they're down one to nothing. Obviously it takes four to get it done. Can the Tampa Bay Rays make a series out of this? Oh yeah, they, they can make a series out of it. If the thing is, is, uh, you know, the Dodgers, I think they actually want to prove people wrong to say, Hey, we, we're going to get a world series this time. You know, I, I think that's in the back of their head back here by the medulla oblongata. And uh, that's exactly what's going to happen is, uh, I think they're going to come through. Would I like to see Tampa Bay win? Yeah, I guess I would. I, I like underdogs. You know, I like I like an even even match. You know, and uh, who knows? Maybe they will. But 
<clears throat> you know, people have always asked me because I've been around the game so long, said, hey, you know who's going to win this game? And I said, no, I don't. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, you don't. Playoffs, World Series, I mean, you flip coins. You know, yeah, and yet, well, going into this series, both teams were the only two teams that won 40 games. So you ended up getting the two teams with the most wins. So it's, it's a good matchup in a sense where it's legitimate that the two best teams in their respective leagues with the highest win totals are facing off, obviously. For the exactly. Yep. But, I mean, it's I, I, think, I think tonight's almost a must-win for Tampa. When you think about it, they have Blake Snell going against the Dodger bullpen. Yep. If the Dodgers somehow pull this up, go up 2 nothing with Bueller going in game three, that's going to be a tough hurdle for the Rays to overcome. Right. Yep. <clears throat> I, think you're, you're, I think you're right on that one, Stuart, for sure. So, so, Mark, when you summarize the 2020 season, what are some of the things that stand out most about this very different campaign, hoping that we'll <laughs> at least get some sort of normalcy next year? Because uh, I was even Don Mattingly admitted it's, it's weird not having reporters ask him questions in person and in the uh, clubhouse, you know, compared to what it is. And who knows what will happen with us in the media next year until – because we don't know exactly how – this COVID thing's going to turn out. We want to think that you get through it this year, but the way everybody's talking, this thing doesn't look like it's going away soon. But put in perspective, Mark, about the 2020 season and how you would uh, analyze the whole thing from start to finish. Well, I think it um, it pushed a lot of things upward fast. Rule change for number one. You know, it pushed it over the top to where you're probably going to have universal DH from now on. And uh, you're going to have maybe the runner on second and who else knows. I think it, it, it's going to have to play out a little bit too to see what the fans think because the fans are the ultimate story in the test. They're the litmus test out there to say what's, what's going to fly and what's not going to fly. You've got your young plant fan. You've got, you know, the fan that was brought up by his, his, his dad, even his daughter took, him, talk, took her to the ball game. And then you've got the older fans. You've got, you know, three different categories of fans in my estimation. So you've, you've got to try to say, are, are we hitting home runs here? Well, I think the millennials, and I, and I like millennials, believe it or not. I do like millennials. Uh, I mean, they got issues, but I still like them. <laughs> but, uh, you know, <laughs> but, but the deal is, is that they've got to, uh, you know, they've got to rein the, the younger people in, you know, some way. I don't know how. But uh, you, you want those young people to hit the home run. They want, you want them walking in the turnstiles when they come into the ballparks, wanting to see a, a baseball game, you know, for whatever reason. You know, to me, the 2020 season was almost like, you know, you go into the bathroom in the middle of the night, it's dark out. You're trying to find your way there, and you might stub your toe on a few things before you get to the end result. But if you do it a few times, you get used to it, you can make that trip to the bathroom without hitting any, anything. And that's kind of what baseball did. They had a little bit of a shaky start. They had to feel their way to the bathroom, make sure they didn't stub their toe that much. But eventually, as the season went on, they were able to make that trip without stubbing their toes or doing anything and turned out okay. Exactly. I, mean, I love your analogy, Mark, last week about the Xbox, because that's what you're dealing with with millennials. You talk about the Xboxes, keeping their attention that way. Nowadays, yeah. everybody has their cell phones or they're distracted anyhow. And part of it might have had to do when they had to put the netting up there because nobody was paying attention to the game and getting hit by balls. Not that you, a fan would get hit with a foul ball anyhow, but when you're not paying attention, your reaction time is different. And you know full well that you can get hurt if you don't pay attention to a certain extent. So, you know, I, I again, when I look at the rule changes per se, I hope they don't go ahead and keep that second man on second base. I really don't like that rule. I don't. I just I mm-hmm. struggle with it. Well, uh, you're going to sell less beer. <laughs> it's, it's, it's true. And yeah, they better look at everything, less beer, less uh, at the concession stand, and less souvenirs if they're getting out of there earlier. I don't know if anybody cares well, about well, that. Cut your advertising dollar down for sure. <laughs> yeah. And yet, you being a St. Louis guy, everybody knows that even though you had the steroid th- situation years ago, don't think that those Cardinals uh, owners will ever give their money back here about uh, opening up the batting practice when Mark McGuire was hitting them out of the park and they were selling some food and some merchandise too. Right. But I do struggle with that man on second base. I had no trouble with the three batter minimum. I really didn't care actually after a while. Sure. 
Yeah. And, I don't, and who knows if they'll have a pitch clock. And we never experimented with that, thankfully, this year. Mm-hmm. So there are certain parts of the rules that you take. But, but how, have, you how about the seven double headers? Well, Don Manningly doesn't like those either. He, he really had a problem with those. Yeah. No way. I mean, but he understood why they did it this year, but no. no. I mean, there's a mindset for a manager with that because – you know, you could be thinking, all right, it's the fifth or sixth inning. I'll just keep my my closer can relax a little. But then you realize, wait a second, <laughs> we're coming up the last inning. I better get him going. Right. Well, right. John Manning would, he would say a lot. The fifth inning was almost like your seventh inning, you know, so you knew that if you got behind early, you didn't have a lot of time to get back in it. And then, of course, we saw an uncharacteristic amount of routes, like the 12 to 15 to nothing varieties or 20 to nothing, which was unheard of back in the day with the larger rosters. I mean, it's just strange. But now, I, I don't know the answer to this, but in a seven-inning game, do you still need to go – does a starter still need to go five innings to qualify for a win in yeah. a seven-inning game? Yeah. Still? You tell me that. Correct. Yeah. It's just like high school and college, but some college, uh, you know, like, uh, in, like say, Division One, they would have a, a nine-inning game and a seven-inning game rather than two sevens. And, you know, but uh, I don't know. They keep changing that one. Uh, but for a major league team to have two sevens, that's just like, uh, you know, let's go to batting practice or something, for instance. You know? right. It's like a walkthrough, you might say. So Yeah, I struggle with that one, too. I mean, I, again, everything we talk about 2020 is so different. No, we're going to play two seven-inning ball games today. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Yeah, right. And then we we get to extra innings, and they're nine or ten, and all of a sudden the man on second base. I mean, for a reliever though, Mark, let's talk about it. You're a reliever. How would yourself have handled going into a game with a man on second base, where you already uh, had him in scoring position? Is there a certain mindset as a reliever, you know, having been in that role yourself? Get out. <laughs> you know, I was. You know, when when my arm was healthy, I did quite well with with runners in scoring position. Good job. Uh, Oh, yeah. Matter of fact, I was like next to Raleigh Fingers at one point, number two on the list and uh, withholding runners. Uh, I might not have had as much time out there as a Raleigh Fingers or some of the others, but, you know, I had, you know, like four years of, of pretty good time out there to where I could hold the runners, you know, you know, well. But, you know, you, you're, you're wanting to get the out. You bear, you bear down just a little bit. You relax a little bit more. You know, to throw well, you have to relax a little bit more. A lot of people don't hear that. They think, oh, don't you have to get up and pump up? No, you don't have to. It's better to relax a little bit more so you can actually do your job. So that's what you do. And, uh, you know, the thing about it is you got to get three outs with that runner out there on second. So if you had a fly ball to right field and he's sitting over at third, you know, is your infield going to pull in or are they going to say we're, we're thinking on scoring a run the next inning? There's a, there's a lot of ifs right there. There's a lot of variables, you know, and major league pitching is, is pretty darn good. So you have to get the out. You just can't let the guy score. There's just no way that you're going to let that guy score. When you look at the way this baseball season has become, and now the NFL is dealing with a lot of these outbreaks on the fly, do you think that the NFL has looked at baseball and, and found themselves in non-panic mode that if baseball can get through this, there's got to be a way that we can weather it because we also see the NFL, obviously, they have to reschedule. I went to a game over the weekend, the Detroit Lions and the Jacksonville Jaguars up in Jacksonville, and there was a uh, mini outbreak that occurred on the practice squad, but they still managed to get the game in anyhow. So I would think that at least the NFL can look back at MLB and learn something from this because I think the NFL is going to have some real challenges since there are a lot more – players on a roster than what you had with major league baseball well you know too <clears throat> if you look at the nfl uh you know they can look back are their numbers still down you know their their numbers on on the television are they still down pretty much do you know i think, I think early on they were i'm not sure the last couple of weeks right well here's the thing and you know and i'm not supposed to say this but they should stand for the national anthem and that might really improve their numbers you don't have to take that from baseball <laughs> So that's my thinking. Well, but you know what? I agree. I, 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 I you say whatever you want. I, I'm with you 100%. There's no excuses not to stand for the national anthem. There's other that's ways right. to protest, but not that one. I, I, I'm with you. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, I, it, that, you know, they can deny that all they want, but it's, it's hurt them. It's going to continue to hurt them. And the numbers might improve over the course of time. I do agree with that 100%. But, you know, 
how, how many years might it take them to get back, if at all? You, has anybody ever considered a football or a baseball team going bankrupt, you know, because of the COVID thing, but also because of all the other issues? That's something to think about, folks. I'm going to tell you that right now. Because baseball at one point, a few years ago, I remember when the Diamondbacks didn't have it right. And then Cincinnati's got a little tough time. And some of these other teams have a little bit of a tough time right now. Right. You know, you don't know their books, you know, and what's going on right there. What's really going on with those books. You have Cohen that just came in and bought the Mets. You know, he's loaded. Jerry Reinsdorf, for some reason, doesn't want him in because he likes A-Rod. He wants to, you know, hug and kiss her A-Rod for some reason. So the other thing is I like Cohen because he's got tons of money. Reinsdorf probably doesn't like him because he can buy probably any player he wants. Well, that's good. He's got the right to do that. He can beef baseball up a little bit also. A-Rod can't do that. Well, Reinsdorf is good friends with A-Rod. Yes. That's, he did that, A. Um, the other issue that Cohen – and what I like about Cohen is Cohen's a lifelong Met fan. So yeah. that's what you want in there. Is As a Met fan, that's what I want to see. Yep. What I was reading today, Mayor de Blasio, New York City, yeah. he can actually veto this ownership change because I guess of some, some sort of rule that was signed like 16, 17 years ago that says if you're a felon, you can't buy a team or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. And Cohen was never a felon, but I guess a company that he was working for back then – had some issues with the SEC. So they're hoping it doesn't come to that, but that came out today mm -hmm. that he could, the mayor, who's not really a popular guy in New York City to begin with, right. but he, he can come out and he could stop that ownership. And it might, you know, he could, in his mind, he might think, well, it looks a lot better if A-Rod and J-Lo own the Mets than Steve Cohen. Mm -hmm. But as a Met fan, I, you know, I want another Met fan owning my team, especially one with oodles and oodles of money. Well, have we done any background check on A-Rod? Is he a felon? Oh, I'm just kidding. No, that's fine. Hey, Mark, I do want to point out some, which I think you really touched on, which is pretty interesting. We have a lot of sports on our on the sports exchange. We do. And I only bring on basketball once in a while, and I haven't had what I consider a real bona fide basketball analyst, and I've got nothing against the sport. The only one I ever had on here was Bucky Waters, who did the college basketball not to say I couldn't get one if I wanted to but one of the things that has turned me off about the NBA I call it the NDL and let me repeat myself Mark NDL you know what that stands for no you'll never get it anyways okay no National, deep. Dra National Drama League don't need it you know and, and don't get me wrong I have no disrespect against the Black Lives Matter movement I don't that has nothing to do with it but either. when when those, when those things take priority over doing your job that you get paid very well to do, then I do have issue with that. I really do. And I'm not afraid to go out on record like I'm doing right now. And that's where I think you're right. So when you made that comment, standing for the national anthem, I agree with you a million percent. I really do, Mark, because I think when you talk about the bottom line, that doesn't mean if I had a good NBA guest, I wouldn't invite him on. I, I just focus on the other sports because, number one, I have certainly a lot of good guests with them because I pursued them. And I have been away from the NBA for a while. The last time I was really ever interested in the NBA was when the Pistons would come down here back in 2004 to play the Miami Heat. But I covered them during the bad boys era when, you know, basketball wasn't a bunch of jump shooters. It was called hard-nosed, good physical basketball instead of all chuck it from the cheap seat. So, you know, and I don't know whether some of these other sports are going these finesse changes where the NFL is going to throw it all over the place and forget about hard-nosed football. Baseball, like you guys have alluded to, where it's either home run or strikeout. You know, you, you, to me, you can't take away strategy. you got to make it interesting. But who am I to make a comment on? I'm just like I can just make an opinion like you guys are. Yeah. You know? So so mm -hmm. we'll talk about the World Series, obviously. one nothing Dodgers lead the series. Mark, do you want to give a prediction as to how, who's going to win and how many games? I'll say uh, Dodgers in six. But – that, I don't like to predict, but I would say Dodgers in six. I would have said if if uh, the turning point last night was the fifth inning, if they would have got out of the fifth inning with four runs, I would I would say they might have turned it around at that point, maybe you know win that game. But you know when they when they got those extra couple three runs right there, I, I thought it was pretty much over. Uh, and you know the game has a rhythm. The also the game has chemistry, and uh, 
you, you would like to think they fought so hard so far, uh, you know, Tampa Bay, that uh, they, they might bounce back. But, you know, I would say the Dodgers at this point. What are you, Stuart? I'm going to go, you know, the Dodgers are coming in on a hot streak. They won the last three against the Braves. Um, I'm going to go with Dodgers in five. Well, you know what? I'm going Dodgers in five, too. I just think Tampa Bay is way too overmatched. They really are. Mm -hmm. You know, you got a lot of studs there. I I think what the Rays have done, and Don Manningly, I like to bring up references because I work with them, of course. He talks about the Tampa Bay Rays, though, being the model organization for which small market teams are made out of, being able to develop their own players and be able to come up with key trades and uh, and have some free agents along with it. Though the Rays are certainly, although the Dodgers, at last I look at, 14 players that they brought up as well from developmental, but they have deeper pockets to be able to retain them, as Mark alluded to earlier. It's one thing to be able to have uh, young players to keep them, and I know that that's one thing the Kansas City Royals dealt with, that they paid for their success. They really did. You bring these guys up, you develop them, and all of a sudden, you know, you get a little light in the wallet when they're ready to make uh, go on to greener pastures. But the Tampa Bay Rays, what they've been able to do with nothing I mean, think about Andrew Friedman for a moment, the architect of the race, and then he goes over to the Dodgers, takes the same model, but he has the ability to go ahead and retain players. I call this the Andrew Friedman Bowl because we need to talk about it. This this is also a series that could determine which city has bragging rights for this year. Who won the NBA championship? Los Angeles Dodgers. Who won the Stanley Cup this year? Tampa Bay Lightning. Right. So now, whichever team wins this series is going to have two championships, right. and they'll be the uh, championship city. Right. Good Title Town USA. Yeah, you're right. You got the Lakers and the Dodgers, or you'll have the Lightning and the Rays. You know, and I. But it's interesting. You know, it really is. But either way, it's certainly, you know, a tale of two. Uh, city so f- far different. I mean, you know, L.A. is L.A. Well, you know, you've got the geriatric ward over there, but that's okay. <laughs> geriatric ward. Maybe that one got past me. <laughs> Tampa Bay. Anyway. <laughs> I thought he was the guy that hosted the uh, Labor Day telephone. Oh, wait, that's Jerry Lewis. No, oh, that's he's Jerry. Jerry Lewis. Okay. <laughs> not geriatric. Jerry Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, I'm I'm getting to the geriatric stage, so that's why I can get away with it. So whatever. Well, you you threw that one by me, and I swung and missed at that one. So. Well, you know, in spring training with the Cardinals, we used to sit out there in uh, St. Petersburg, and we'd be out in the uh, right field bullpen. And you know, if you get a really hot, n- nice uh, Sunday afternoon game, you'd see about eight or nine. Yep, there's another one dropped off. Look at that. There's another ambulance. You know, here, here's another gurney. Look at that gurney over there. <laughs> oh, I got it. About, yeah, we have about eight or nine dropping out. At least they got air conditioning. You know, they just died from a heart attack trying to get to their seat. You know, so. Well, you're talking about L.A. Field? Is that what you're talking about? You know, I'm talking about Tampa Bay. Oh, Don't Tampa. you know all the old folks that go to Florida? You know? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're all the millennials and the nuts out in, in, in L.A. out there. And then you got the old folks down there, you know, fishing and stuff. You know, and hey, I caught a fish today. Okay. Well, well let me tell you, when I, when I was covering high school football at, down in the, in the Tampa area, because I used to work for the Tampa Tribune, oh. I ended up stopping in St. Petersburg and ate at a Morrison's Cafe. Cafe yep. area. I was the only one with brown hair in the place, and I knew where the old geriatric horn in the seniors. I said, boy, I feel out of place in here at Morrison's Cafeteria, and I wonder why. Uh, yeah, we used to go there during uh, spring training, and, eat, you know, for seven fifty, you know, we'd look old down there. You know, ee, okay, we'd be in the salad bar and just raiding the hell out of it and stuff like that. And then you'd uh, you'd trip out. you got to watch the, the people when we took the bus out from uh, Payne Park, you know, where we stayed down at the hotel, the Sarasota Hotel, and we took it out to the complex, and you'd see all these old people on three-wheelers. You know, we just go out there with our tongues hanging out on the windows, you know. Uh, you know. So Makes you yeah. wonder after COVID-19, yeah. will there be any more buffet-style meals anymore? i got to wonder. That's yeah, true, yeah. 
COVID-19 and the wonderful world of COVID-19 where you wonder whether remote broadcasting and how many more media will, more media will attend games, which will be for another day. But I'll tell you what, it is just so weird to see that a lot of uh, these games are not being called at the stadium. I mean, then again, 2020 is weird per se. So, so Stuart, anything else you want to add to our uh, top-notch baseball analyst? No. Yeah. No, let's see how the rest of the World Series plays out. Will this be Clayton Kershaw's redemption? Mm-hmm. Or will Tampa Bay get over the opening day opening game jitters and, you know, make this a series? Well, yeah. Mark, let's tell you, you know I'm going to defer to you, and you have some major work to do, my friend. You get to show us a couple of books, and you get to show us a first-class Nutty Buddy demo. Well, it's going to be short and quick, <clears throat> and this was my first book, and it's on the eighth day God made baseball. And, uh, and that's a hand wrapped around a baseball with a world in it right there. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fun read. It's, uh, it's kind of like not mo- like most sports books because I don't use a lot of stats. I tell stories. And unfortunately, those stories are true. You know, I cannot show you a second book on Country Boy conveniently while wow, because I'm sold out. Wow. Is that not amazing? Wow. So I've got some more coming in, but... Country Boy Conveniently Wild was my second book, and it's all basically farm stories because I'm a redneck and I grew up on a farm, country boy, and uh, soybean and cotton. I even stuffed a teacher inside a cotton picker one time and packed, it, packed him in like a sardine, and he was, uh, he was a northern boy like, uh, well, like some of you guys maybe, but anyway, uh, I packed him in there, and uh, that's Country Boy Conveniently Wild. This here is the Nutty Buddy. That is the best cup on the market. It's... Uh, I, I designed this cup. I've won five awards on this cup, and I'm an idiot. And the thing about it is, it's anatomically correct. It fits. This is called the Flex. You can see it's way different than anybody else's, and it's been tested a whole bunch across the whole big wide world here. But I do have five sizes. I have Hammer, Boss, Hog, Trophy, and, of course, Mongo. So Mongo is for the big old boys, and the hammers are for eight, eight and nine-year-olds. So we have five sizes instead of three, and this can take a 90-mile-an-hour shot. And if you don't believe me, go to YouTube, Nutty Buddy, and look under that, and you'll see me take shots from many, many, a, many a gun out there. Uh, I, 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 th- I think I told you uh, on this broadcast before, that I was a catcher in minor league baseball before, didn't I? Or I don't know if I did, but I was a catcher. for. And I'd tell you, I could have used one of those back then because let me tell you, I used to get hit with one foul ball after another. And, you know, and I took a pounding behind the plate. I What I loved about the position, though, was the ability to manipulate the umpire and distract them and frame pitches. And as a pitcher, you know how, how much fun us catchers had to try to make things go a little better. And you know? some of my best interviews have always come uh, with catchers. Oh, I've, I've interviewed them all, Mark. Don't get me wrong. But, you know, being a catcher, I can appreciate the nutty buddy. My dad at that time owned a sporting goods store called All Pro Sporting Goods out in Oak Park, Michigan. And he yeah. made, there, there was a uh, – a lot of cups nearby in case his son quite needed them. You never knew that? I never told you that he owned a sporting goods store in Oak Park, Michigan? Didn't know that one. No, well, I got, yeah, I got to throw it out there. You brought the nutty, buddy, so you set me up very well. So what can I tell you? But I went through those cups, and I tell you what, knowing what we know now in 2020 or 2019 when we started a nutty, buddy, promotion with you, I certainly could have used it back then. So any other way that people can get all of you, Mark? Yeah, I just, uh, if you see my name right down there, Mark Littell, put a .com on it and you can get a hold of my books or you can go to nuttybuddy.com and, you know, uh, check it out because uh, it really is a good cup. You know, it's won a lot of awards. Uh, it's very comfortable. I've had you know, kids fall asleep with those cups on and uh, it's just not for baseball. It's uh, anybody that's got a pair. So there you go. Uh, just you know, folks, you're, uh, this is the Sports Exchange. My name is Scott Morgan, Rock Motor City, Mad Mouth, along with Stuart Hack and our baseball analyst, Mark Littell. This is our World Series edition of the Sports Exchange. We're glad to have Mark. We have two weeks in a row. We love having him on because we have a blast doing it. Anyways, Stuart Hack, why don't you let everybody know how they get old to you? All right. So I am with Hack Tax and Accounting Services in Wellington, Florida. That's Palm Beach County. And all my tax returns are anatomically correct. So don't forget it. <laughs> At 561-214-6171 on the web, hacktaxandaccounting.com or stuart at hacktaxandaccounting.com. 
All right, well, let me give you my long list of information, okay? And I don't need the Texas Instrument Calculator that Stuart Hack did because I wouldn't have that many things to type much in there, but throw it in there anyways. Okay, now you can buy them for 5 or $10 a piece when I was using them and had it taken away from my teachers. It was $50 over at Cunningham Drugs. And make, let me tell you, $50 back in the 70s was a lot of money, but that's beside the point. So yes. anyway, if you want to listen to the audio version of this broadcast, you can do so on Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, or Spotify by iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Let me repeat that again, since I talk faster than any cars fly, okay? And that's this, Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. You want to follow us? I'll give you many ways to do that. You can do so at Twitter, at Tribune South, Facebook, uh, and Instagram, South Florida Tribune, uh, our YouTube channel. The South Florida Tribune. I'll give you six reasons why you should uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel. We have the Sports Exchange, a program you're uh, watching and listening to now. No Limits. Uh, Mark Littell has appeared on 108 Stitches Baseball Talk. The Real and the Rare, Fantasy Football, and the South Florida Tribune Podcast. So we have six shows that you can listen to there. So please subscribe to the South Florida Tribune um, YouTube channel. No cost to do it. Just a little, about a second and a half of your time. Uh, our website is com. We have uh, inf- stories from our media distribution partners, which, you know, Mark, the Miami Dolphins feed us material, the Jacksonville Jaguars do, the Detroit Lions as well, uh, as well as other uh, places as well for Atlantic. Uh, you can, you'll be able to find our media distribution partners, the Motor City Monitor, where we, since I am from the metro Detroit area, we go out there and like to promote my hometown as well. And, of course, we have our regular columnists that we promote as well. We also have the WSAN drop-down, which allows everybody to find every one of our shows. All you got to do is hit that drop-down. Uh, you can email us at southfordertribune at gmail.com. And you can uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. Scott Morganroth will be more than happy to go ahead and connect with you there. So, guys, it's been a great show, Mark. You know how much we enjoy having you on the broadcast. This is really a lot of fun. And I'm so glad that we're able to visualize it and look forward to the day that hopefully we'll have a chance to meet person. But to me, this is really great stuff having you, Mark. And I can, I'm eternally grateful for every time you come on the broadcast. And I think we're very blessed to do that. Stuart, you want to give everybody the COVID-19 message, please, about what everybody should be doing? Okay. Wear your masks. Stay uh, social distance, six feet apart. <clears throat> just be vigilant. Just be aware and just stay safe, everybody. Well, I couldn't have said it better than myself, but I'm wearing this hat for Mark Littell. It's, oh, my yeah, God. Yeah, this is at Palm Beach Cardinals. They had to start in Class A. I don't have the St. Louis Cardinals, but you know what? This hat for you, Mark. It, 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 it dawns yeah. your colors, my friend. And I, you, know I what, uh, you know what closers do, don't you? What? They throw peas at the knees, no pies in the eyes, no wall balls, and you'll be just fine. Well, you know what? I'll take that for whatever it's worth. <laughs> Well, well, it is what it is. All I can tell you, Mark, and I say this from my heart and my mind, you really are the best. And God bless. We just love having you on. And to me, you're a great friend. And please don't you ever forget that. You really are. I'm so proud to be uh, working with you as often as we can. Believe me, it, it's it's really good stuff, Mark. So we appreciate you being on here and sharing your experiences, your stories, and your insight with us. Your contribution is so uh, appreciated. You can only imagine how we really feel about you. So, Thank you. Thank you're you. You're welcome. So, so on behalf of Stuart Hack, Mark Littell, my name is Scott Morgan, Rotham Motor City, Manmouth. Thank you for joining us on this edition of the Sports Exchange. Good night, everybody, and be safe. And enjoy the World Series and everything that lies ahead. Good night.